Well, welcome to the final class of our CSE 201. For those uh, just joining us, welcome. Uh, we've got some visitors here tonight. We've been talking about what's on our seminar tape number two. We just started that about uh, the Garden of Eden. What was that like? And we talked about when did Satan fall from heaven? There are those who teach Satan fell from heaven before the creation. There are lots of Christians who believe that. That is totally not possible scripturally. It is scripturally impossible, scientifically, you know, and historically, etc., unnecessary. Okay? Satan and the angels rejoiced when the foundations were laid. We covered that, Job chapter 38. The foundations weren't laid till day three, uh, Genesis 1 9. So Satan could not have fallen from heaven before the foundations were laid. Everything was very good at the end of day 6. Genesis 1.31 tells us that. So if everything was very good, you can't say, you know, Satan had fallen from heaven. Everything was still very good at the end of day 6. Adam was 130 when Seth was born. And uh, Seth was uh, born after Cain and Abel, but no dates are given for those guys. So we don't know exactly when that happened. So all we know is we suspect Satan probably fell from heaven about 100 years after the creation. Certainly after day seven, God said it's very good, and then he rested, and then they, uh, at 130, they were already out of the garden by then, but no dates are given. I don't see any way to tell exactly from Scripture when Satan fell, but I know it had to be somewhere during that time frame, day seven or day eight, let's say, up to maybe 100 years later, because we don't know how old Cain and Abel were when they got in the fight. Pick a number and say they were 30, well then, you know, 100 years they could have been in the garden. Probably Lucifer got jealous of the fellowship they were having with God. And we mentioned last time how that the gap theory was invented by Thomas Chalmers, Masonic Lodge member and uh, Presbyterian theologian. Uh, Thomas Chalmers, it's not the historical position of the church. Uh, Pember gave it lots of recognition in his book and then C.I. Schofield really spread the gap theory. And I was raised with the gap theory as a young Christian. I've got, I think, three or four Schofield Bibles all worn out, all thoroughly marked up in there. I've worn out a bunch of them. Got some great footnotes in most places, but don't buy into that gap theory one. The Dake Study Bible teaches this. A lot of people teach this. It violates all kinds of scriptures and puts death before sin, and we did all that last week. Okay, the other compromise theory that people come up with, does this look familiar? Uh, we cover this about certain phrases in the Bible they use without form and void. Okay, arguments for the gap theory. <coughs> where they say, well, the word replenish means fill again. That was not true in 1611. What did the word replenish mean in 1611? Yeah. Fill. When did they change it? 1890s, roughly. Well, they added a second meaning in 18, 1650, but they took out the original meaning, and the, you know, the new dictionaries don't have it in there at all. So this is totally wrong. Replenish does not mean fill again, not in 1611. The argument that says six days only mean current earth, that involves adding to God's Word. Because God said He made everything in six days. So they say, well, that only means, you know, the earth. It doesn't include this heaven and earth, the heavens. They're adding to God's Word at that point. They'll say, well, Lucifer's flood took place during this gap. And I say, no, there is no Lucifer's flood. Now you're adding to the Word of God very clearly. No mention anywhere of Lucifer's flood. They'll say, well, Genesis 1 has the word and between every single verse. So this means a break in time. I would say, oh, mon contraire, mon frère. And means every verse is connected. All of Genesis chapter 1 is one sentence. Nearly all of it. One big long sentence. Six consecutive days, continuous, one big long story. Okay? They say, well, modern science has proven the earth is billions of years old. Well, that's totally wrong. Okay? The argument that they say the word and indicates a gap in time, I don't understand. That's just such a weak argument in my opinion. And since to, to say there's a gap between verse 1 and 2 would violate so many other scriptures, it becomes a heresy. The biggest danger with the gap theory teaching, in my opinion, is not that they're saying, well, the earth is billions of years old. I don't care if people believe that. But what bothers me is that puts death before sin. And now you clearly have a heresy compared to what the Bible says. Okay. This is the other most commonly accepted theory to try to put billions of years into the Bible. It's called the day-age theory. In other words, maybe the days are not really days. Maybe each day is an age, a long period of time. How many have ever heard that idea before? The day-age theory. In the Living Bible, in my collection of Bibles that I've gotten over the years, I noticed this verse in verse 13. Let the earth burst forth with every sort of grass, 
and seed-bearing plant and fruit trees, blah, blah, blah. It says in verse 16, all this occurred on the third day. Remember we mentioned earlier how the King James uses the first day, the second day. I said, yay, I finally found we got another one. You know, Living Bible says the first day, the second day, the third day. But it's got a little asterisk right next to the word the third day, and it's got a note at the bottom that says, literally, this is a period of time. Anytime I see a footnote, I hear a preacher say the same thing. Well, literally this means red flags go up. Excuse me, preacher. You've had one year of Greek and one year of Hebrew, and you know more than the King James translators? I don't think so. I would doubt that real, real seriously, okay? Uh, if God promised to preserve His Word, well then where is it? I would like to hold a copy, please, you know? Show it to me. So, he says, literally, right? Anytime you see that, red flags ought to go up. In other words, they're going to change what the Bible said to fit their current theory. He says, literally, <clears throat> this is a period of time. And the, gap, the day age theory people always use Psalm 90 as one of their proof verses. You know, anytime somebody's got a theory or a doctrine, they have proof text, which is what you're supposed to do. That's the proper way to do it. Here's what I believe. Here's why. Blank, blank, verse, 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 verse. That's exactly correct. I'm for that. But the proof verses the day age theory use, people use are silly for the day age theory. Look at this. Psalm 90, verse 4. A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Okay. A thousand years looks like a day. You go to 2 Peter, chapter 3, and it says, One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. I'd like you to notice a couple things. These are the only two verses where anything similar to this appears in the Bible. Only two verses that there are. Psalm 90, verse 4, 2 Peter 3, 8. Neither of these verses say million or billion, do they? They both say thousand, right? And secondly, neither of these verses have anything to do with the creation. Both verses are simply saying, time doesn't mean anything to God. We are the ones that are stuck in time. God is not stuck in time. This is not 7 or 6.45 p.m., in heaven, <laughs> okay? This is also not December 1st, 2005 in heaven. There is no time in heaven, none. See, if God's limited by time, if he has to wait around till tomorrow, he's not God. That's probably one of those impossible concepts for the human brain to grasp. I doubt it's possible for us to understand what this, what I'm talking about, but God's not stuck in time. We are stuck in time. Did I give the illustration in here about the Grand Canyon and the guy in the helicopter? Yes, no, some say, yeah. Anyway. If a guy in a helicopter is watching a bunch of people go to the Grand Canyon on rafts, you know, he in a helicopter's position can see all the rafts. He can see the whole thing. Each of them can see the helicopter, but none of them can see each other because of the twists and turns of the river. Okay. The river is like time. We are stuck in 2005. Well, there was also a boat back in 2004 and 2002 and, you know, 1820 and, you know, 1400 B.C. Well, we can, I cannot see tomorrow. There are many, many times I wish I could. How many of you know what, been, know what I'm talking about? Boy, if only I knew what was coming tomorrow. There have been thousands of times I wished I could go back just three seconds. Anybody ever wish you could just jump back just a couple seconds, you know? Hit that chainsaw against your knee, bam! Oh, man, if only I could just go back a couple seconds. I wouldn't do it that way, you know? I would think of something else. Uh, but we can't. We are absolutely 100% stuck in time. God is not. If He were, He would not be God. Time would become God. So, these two verses, thousand years as a day, and a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years like yesterday, have nothing to do with the creation. I have in my Bible collection in the library, you can come take a look at it, what's called the Farrar Fenton Bible. In 1903, <clears throat> a guy traveling around, a preacher traveling around, you know, speaking on Bible, he was a Bible scholar, he wrote his own version of the Bible. Here it is. I've got it in my library, the Farrar Fenton Bible, 1903. He says in verse 1, and by the way, notice he says, translated direct from the Hebrew by Farrar Fenton. 
Hebrew scholar going to tell us, everybody else has been wrong all these centuries. I'm right. Follow me. Here we go. Okay? He says, by periods, God created that which produced the solar systems, then that which produced the earth. That's Genesis 1.1. Does that sound kind of like the Bible, you know, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth? By periods, God created. What's he trying to say there? Long periods of time, yeah. These days aren't really days. They're long periods of time. How about verse number 5? And the light God gave the name of day, and to the darkness he gave the name of night. This was the close and the dawn of the first age. What does he mean by that? This is a long period of time, right? Verse 8. This was the close and the dawn of the second age. It goes all through all seven days and does that. He does that to all of them, okay? The first age, the second age, the third age, the fourth age. And the guy claims he's a Hebrew scholar, okay? Translated direct from the Hebrew. Here's what, whenever, anytime anybody does this, it ought to put red flags up. When they get up in, you know, preaching or writing books or anything about the Bible, and they say, well, this would be better translated, blah, 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 or it says in the original Hebrew, blah, 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 right away, bingo, think about what they're saying. Don't swallow it, okay? Be real cautious about that stuff. Um, for our Fenton, the Hebrew scholar says this is a period of time, the first age, the second age, the third age. Well, there are some real obvious problems with this idea. Could the days of creation have been long millions of year periods of time? Well, let's see. Genesis 1, 11. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. And blah, 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 talks about it for a while. and says, God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. What day did God make the trees, grass, plants, etc.? Day three. Verse 18 and 19. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, which we would assume to be the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, we assume to be the moon, though actually it may not be the moon. The lesser light might be the canopy of water or ice conducting light to the far side. We'll cover that later. But, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Wow. He made the grass, the plants, the trees on day three, he made the sun on day four. I taught biology for a long time. I would suspect that'd be kind of hard on them plants waiting for the sun to come up, if those days are thousands of years, right? Even if it's a week, it's going to be hard on them plants, okay? <laughs> waiting for the sun to come up. I was up in uh, Barrow, Alaska. It's as far north as you can get, way at the top of Alaska. Bing, put a dot, there's Barrow, okay? There's one tree, one tree in the whole city of 4,000 people. That tree is in a Chinese restaurant. Okay, there are no trees in anybody's yard. This tree is about this tall, about that big around, scrawniest tree you've ever seen in a little Chinese restaurant. They have a horrible time keeping that thing alive. Why would that be? There's no sun for four, five, six months out of the year. I mean, we're talking Barrow, Alaska, okay? No sun at all. I mean, the Arctic Circle, you know, way inside the Arctic Circle, it's not really dark for six months out of the year, but it's, you know, real dark for a long time. It gets total darkness for at least probably five months a year in Barrow. I could calculate that. Who cares? But um, they can't keep the tree alive. If you can't keep a tree alive for five or six months without artificial light shining on it to, you know, try to babysit this dumb tree in your restaurant, <laughs> how, how is this going to work in the creation? Who's going to go around shining the lights on these trees? You know, stay alive, stay alive, you know, you'll make it. Now, <clears throat> on day five, God made the birds and the insects. Those two are essential to pollinate plants. So here we got Farrar Fenton trying to tell us the days are law or periods of time. I would say, uh, Farrar, I think you have a problem here. The very order of creation would say, what you're teaching is not true. Which is why the Bible says, I think, study to show yourself approved unto God. King David, before he was King David, 
was listening to Goliath, you know, make the challenge, you know, send me a man and I'll go fight him. I love what Chuck Holcomb did on that in that devotions that time. I don't know why I never saw that before. Goliath said, send me a man and I'll fight him, just me and him, you know, mano a mano, me, one against one. When Goliath shows up, there's two of them. He's got his armor bearer carrying the shield. <laughs> What's this one against one stuff? You got two, okay? <laughs> you lying or cheating already? Of course he's lying and cheating, right? Two against one. But uh, the, how did I get off on all that? The David, Goliath, one of them birds that flew by and you grab it and you don't know what you got till you look in your hand. Show yourself to Buddha. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so David goes to King Saul and says, hey, I'll go, I'll go fight this guy. King Saul said, you're just a kid. He said, he's been a man of war from his youth. David said, I killed a bear and a lion. I can, t I can take him. And Saul said, here, take my armor. Puts his armor on. David's got this, Saul's, you know, head and shoulders taller than everybody else in the kingdom. So Saul's a big guy. David puts the armor on and says, I cannot go in these. I have not proved them. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. It might mean I've never fought with this stuff on before and I've never, I don't know that I can do it, but I know I can handle my sling. Okay? Just leave me alone. I just, I got my sling. I'm good with this. Okay? Let me handle this. That might mean what he means I didn't prove, I haven't proved it. Or, it might mean, um, you know, it's too big, I can't handle this. The point, regardless of what he meant by that when he said that, you know, I've not proved them, I think there's a valuable lesson here. You need to go in your own armor. Get what you're good at, get what you can defend yourself with. David says, look, all I need is this robe I'm wearing and this sling and a couple of rocks. Watch. Now I was over there in the spot where most people are pretty certain they know exactly where this battle took place, you know. We went over there, the guide stopped the tour bus, we all got out walked out this huge field with two great big hills on each side. He said, this is where it happened, David and Goliath. There's a dry creek bed running through there, probably half as wide as this room, maybe 15 feet wide. And the whole creek bed for probably a half mile is billions, maybe not billions, certainly hundreds of thousands of rocks about golf ball size, all rounded. We've got a bunch in the, one of the cases over there. I, I got a bunch of the rocks from that creek bed. Now, I have heard, I cannot prove this, okay, but I have heard that it was a double insult when David killed Goliath with that rock because the Hebrew army had a tradition of when they marched on their battles of not taking toilet paper with them, they would use a smooth stone instead of toilet paper. <laughs> so that's, even if the story's not true, I like telling it because it really sounds good, okay? Here, Goliath, take this, you know, whap, you know. But he said, I haven't proved it. David said, I haven't proved this armor. We've got an awful lot of people that are taking somebody else's word for it. They'll read a Farrar Fenton Bible and say, wow, he studied Hebrew. Wow, oh, 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 Farrar Fenton. And they go on and they teach. Or Schofield, oh, my hope is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and righteousness. I dare not trust the Thompson chain, but wholly lean on Schofield's name. <laughs> there are an awful lot of good study Bibles out there, okay? This is going to be, sound a little complicated, but see, the Bible is inspired of God. The footnotes are not, okay? Somebody else put those in there later. There might be some really good ones, and there might be some really bad ones. And you have to learn real early in life a simple lesson. Eat the meat, spit out the bones. If you don't learn that real early when you're a little bitty kid, you're going to choke on something as you go through life, all right? There is an awful lot of good in the Schofield Reference Edition, a lot of good, thousands of really amazing good notes. There are some amazing good notes in Henry Morris's Defender's Bible. We sell it right there in the bookstore. I highly recommend it. But we put a disclaimer with it. Henry, I, before I did that, I sent the disclaimer to Dr. Morris. He's a good friend of mine, brilliant man, loves the Lord like I've never met anybody as godly as he is. And his son, John Morris, good close friend of mine. But when I read his Bible, and he said there are errors, copyist errors in the Bible, I read through that, and I, I wrote him a letter. I said, Brother Morris, I love you. We're gonna, we want to sell your Bible. But before I sell this, I'd like to ask you to change some of these footnotes, you know. I'm going to have to put a disclaimer with it. I think you're wrong about this note, and you're wrong about this one. And I, and I explained why, kindly. When I called about two weeks later, Dr. Morris, did you get my letter? Yep, got your letter, Brother Hoven. Did you read it? Yep, read your letter. What do you think? He said, well, I wish you didn't have to say this. So do I, you know. <laughs> Fix it and I won't have to say it. So you better get your own armor on, okay, every one of you. 
you better be able to defend your faith with your own armor. Now, if that's a sling and a rock, okay. If that's a sword and a shield or a mace or whatever you use, whatever you're good at, you know, use it, okay? Uh, everybody's different. God gave me a certain set of talents and abilities, and there's some things I just can't do, okay? I still type with two fingers. Probably always will. I've tried and tried to pick it up, you know, you know, take a Mavis Beacon typing program. I don't have time, okay? I can just hire a secretary. Let you do it, okay? Here's my letters. I do. I make tapes, give them to her. You type them out, please, okay? She already knows how to type. She likes it. She's good at it. Why should I waste my time learning something she's already good at, okay? Just say, type them out, fix it for me. Um, so you better get your own armor on, whatever you're good at, develop your own system of handling the skeptics and scoffers and atheists, uh, and don't trust Schofield's Notes or Dake's Study Bible or Thompson Chain just because some brilliant scholar said something. The debate I did with Hugh Ross, three hours long on the John Ankerberg show. Okay, how many got to see any of that? Okay, John Ankerberg, uh, the Hugh Ross debate, it's in the bookstore there. One of John Ankerberg's main arguments for this day age theory right here, okay, was Gleason Archer believed it. Okay. He said Gleason, Gleason Archer was a brilliant linguist. He spoke all kinds of languages. He would take notes in class in Hittite. Okay. See? That proves he's smart. I would agree. Smart guy. I don't know, I don't know any Hittite at all. Anybody here know any Hittite? Okay. <laughs> uh, so the argument, think about the logic though. Because this guy, Gleason Archer, can take notes in Hittite, Therefore, we better listen to everything he says. No, 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 no. Don't fall for that one at all, okay? Even if somebody's got a good godly testimony, Hugh Ross is an extremely smart man, a very kind, uh, well-meaning, well-behaved individual. When people pick on him and call him names, as a lot of people do, he just sweetly, quietly takes it like a gentleman. You know, he really is... is, is He's one of the nicest and smartest heretics I've ever met in my life, okay? And you put a guy like me, who tends to be a little sarcastic once in a while and a little bit, you know, biting comments and a little cutting edge kind of stuff, you know, in the same room with him, there's no competition. I look bad. He looks good. I can't compete with the, you know, the smile, the buttery, oh, you really shouldn't, you should be sweeter and kinder, Brother Hoven. You know, you put a guy like Elijah who just killed 850 prophets in a room with one of the, you know, prophets. Oh, isn't everything wonderful? Good God, good devil, good Bible, good, good world, good everything. You just can't compete with their smooth, you know, suave attitude, you know. <laughs> but that is not how you determine right from wrong. If a message is coming, coming from somebody who's a grouch, he still may be right. And if a message is coming from somebody who's sweet and kind and never gets offended, they may have a lot of good Christian traits in many areas. You may meet somebody who doesn't have many good Christian traits, but still is telling you the truth. You don't decide truth based upon, is the speaker nice or mean? That's not how you decide it. Peter Ruckman is mean. Rude, crude, crass, and mean. Okay, he really is, okay? But he's right on most things. Now he's wrong on some things, but he's right on most things. But uh, he doesn't need to be rude, crude, cream, and, you know, uh, crass and all that stuff in some areas, but sometimes you have to. People say, Brother why are you so sarcastic with the scoffers and skeptics and atheists? You know, you should be kind and be nice to them. I say, well, I try to be kind and be nice. I mean, you can watch the debates. I don't get up and go punch them in the nose ever, okay? But um, all through the Bible, God calls people fools, slow of heart, you whited sepulchers, you bunch of vipers, you snakes. He called Herod a fox. I'm just trying to be like my Heavenly Father, you know, I'm just trying to do it like He did it, you know, <laughs> that's all. But there are some good Bible notes, the good Schofield Bible or Dake Study Bible, they got a lot of good notes in a lot of places, but you better put on your own armor. Don't put on Schofield's armor, it has some holes in it, okay? Don't put on Henry Morris's armor. It's good armor in many places, but he's got a few holes in it. You know the story of Achilles, right? Mama held him by the heel, dipped him in the river, now he's invincible except for that one spot. So the story goes, okay, it's a bunch of baloney, but interesting story. I think that a lot of these guys have good armor, but you better just put your own on and plug the holes, okay? Here's a James Barr, professor of Hebrew at Vanderbilt University. Former 
Regis Professor of Hebrew at Oxford University. He wrote in a letter to David Watson that he said, and by the way, James Barr believes in evolution as far as I know. He's a Hebrew scholar. Uh, he does not believe the literal Genesis account. But here's what he said. Probably so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew of Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to their readers the idea that creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours, which we now experience. Or to put it negatively, the apologetic arguments which suppose the days of creation to be long eras of time, the figures of years not to be chronological, and the flood to be merely a local Mesopotamian flood are not taken seriously by such professors as far as I know. Here we have James Barr, world-class Hebrew scholar, which doesn't mean he's right, but he says, as far as he knows, all the Hebrew scholars believe Genesis 1 teaches six literal 24-hour days. They do not believe the days are long periods of time. I mean, they might personally believe that, but they, they are saying they know that Genesis doesn't teach that. You following that? These guys know Genesis doesn't teach that, even though they personally believe it. And this idea of a local flood, when I debated Hugh Ross, I said, well, you know, if there was a uh, flood, wouldn't that wipe out all evidence of these billions of years? I mean, if the earth is billions of years old and all these layers of rock that we see are actually different ages, isn't the flood going to mess all that up? Obviously it would, which is why nearly always the day-age people also fall for another heresy of teaching it was a local flood or it was a tranquil flood. Water came up slowly, drowned everybody, went back down, left no record behind. No evidence. Because they don't want to mess up their dumb geological column. That's the problem. That becomes their Bible. So James Barr says these Hebrew professors are not buying this idea that the days are not normal 24-hour days. The word yom is the Hebrew word for day, translated day. It's used 1,541 times in the King James Version. Now there probably could be added to that maybe a few thousand other references. Like if you, I just typed in my God's Word for Windows program, the word day. Let me do that for you here, show you how you do that. By the way, God's Word for Windows you can download for free off the internet. I don't know how to do it, but uh, you can figure it out how to do it. God's Word for Windows. You just type in the word day, D-A-Y, and you get 1,541 verses. Now let's add to that today, okay? T-O-D-A-Y. No phrases found today. Yes, there are. What else would have the word day in it? Uh, yesterday. Nine references to the word yesterday. That would be referring to a literal day, obviously. Yesterday is one day. Yesterday would not mean last week. Yesterday would mean yesterday, okay? How about the word tomorrow? Would that be referring to a one particular day, okay? One M, okay. That's why I got you, what? Two R's, Two R's one M. So that's why you do the letters in the spelling. No phrases for tomorrow. tomorrow. What? Tomorrow. On the morrow? 101 references for morrow. It came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said. So there's 1,540 some verses that say day, nine of them that say yesterday, 101 that say morrow. I'm assuming, I thought there's a tomorrow in there. Maybe the word's never used in the Bible. Now, well, you can go through yourself and figure out. There's roughly, let's say, 16, 1,700 references to the word day. Some say there are 1,800 references to day. I don't know. Maybe they just typed in a Hebrew Bible word search, the word yom, and got 1,800. That could be it. But there's, anyway, over 1,000, 1,500 or so, 1,600 references to day. 1,539 of them, it obviously means a normal day. One time, it means 12 hours. You can look up John 11, 9. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? 
Well, what does that mean? 12 hours of daylight, okay. So the word day can mean a 24-hour day or the 12 hours of the day. God made the day and the night. One time, <clears throat> and only once in the Bible, there's a question about what does this really mean, and that is Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Look at that one up if you would, right here at the bottom of the screen. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now there are two options here. Option number one, this is referring to the entire creation week. That's what Hugh Ross says, and he uses that as proof that the word day does not always mean 24-hour day. Well, there are 1,539 where it obviously means 24-hour day, okay? One where it obviously means 12 hours, and one that probably has two possible meanings, and only two. Well, look, look at, when it says, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. How long did it take God to make the heavens and the earth? Careful now, that's a trick question. What? How long did it take God to make the heavens and the earth? Was it six days? No, it was one day, wasn't it? Day one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So I think Genesis 2, 4 is also referring to one day, not the whole week. He made the heaven and the earth in one day. He spent the rest of the time making the plants and the fish and the critters and all that stuff. But I think even Genesis 2, 4 is talking about one literal 24-hour day. Some people say, well, how could they have days before the sun? The sun's not made till day four, so that proves these aren't normal days. That's another argument they use. What would you say to that one? Correct, the sun's not made till day four. Does that mean day one, two, three could be long periods of time? God is light. First 13 verses of the Bible, there's light, but there's no sun. The last 26 verses of your Bible, if you turn to the very back of it, Revelation chapter 21, you can count it up. The last 26 verses of the Bible, they have light, but they have no sun. It says, let's see, how's that go? They have no need of the sun, for he is the light thereof. I suspect, and we'll cover more on this on seminar part seven in about eight years when we get there, but uh, I suspect God purposely made the sun later in the creation week just so his children would know not to worship it. How many cultures around the world worship the sun? All kinds of them, okay? You go to Mexico and all over you see pottery and things to hang on the wall of the sun, you know, the sunburst. It's a sun worship culture. Um, First 13 verses, no sun, they still have light. Last 26 verses, they have sun, they still have no light. They have light, but they have no sun, okay? They have that backwards. So I don't buy the argument that Genesis 2-4 is referring to a period of time. And then guys like Hugh Ross and these guys will say, well, don't you know when it says, we say, in the days of Abraham Lincoln, or in, in Abe Lincoln's day, well, that's a modern-day expression. That's not found in the Bible anyplace, okay? It doesn't say in, you know, Adam's day, but or in uh, David's day. But it's true, today we use that expression, you know, back in Theodore Roosevelt's day, and we're talking about a time period. It's exactly correct. There's an English idiom today where the word, the, just the word day might mean a long period of time. That does not mean the Bible teaches that. That does not mean the Bible even references such a thing. And I would defy anybody to show me any place where the Bible teaches anything other than a 24-hour day. Um, Acts chapter 9, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. Paul, Saul, actually, on the road to Damascus. Could that be 3,000 years? Is it possible to, uh, to reinterpret that to mean 3 million years? What would you say that means? Three days, three days. okay. Jesus said, I'm going to destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What did he mean by that? Talking about his body. Was he in the grave for 3,000 years? Three weeks? Three million years? Three periods of time? 
three ages, three eras? Three days, duh. You could find dozens, probably hundreds of examples in the Bible like that, you know, where it was, the, the word day is so obvious it means day, it can't mean anything else. Why couldn't it mean that in Genesis chapter 1? No verses in the Bible where Yah means anything other than a normal 24-hour day, especially if it is modified with a number, like the second day. Now, I don't speak in Hebrew. Well, I know the alphabet, but that's about it, but, and a few words. But I've been told that in the Hebrew version of, the, of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And it goes through the verse, and it says, day one, day two, day three. The King James translators very wisely chose the phrase, the first day to make it like it can't be more obvious, the first day, the second day, cannot be made more clear. Because that's the best way to translate the Hebrew phrase day one, day two, day three, day four. Good book on the gap theory is uh, this one which we sell um, by Fields. And be sure to get our video debate with Hugh Ross if you want to watch that. After the debate there were so many things left unanswered because the guy is smooth and slick, okay? He said all kinds of comments I had no time to respond to. Like he said, well, even astronomer Danny Faulkner believes the days might be long periods of time. So I called Danny Faulkner in South Carolina and said, Danny, would you be willing, I'll fly you down to Pensacola. I want you to sit in front of the camera. We're going to videotape an interview. I want to talk to you. I want you to watch Hugh Ross's tape, and we're going to discuss it. He said, sure. He had an hour and a half worth of comments about Hugh Ross and some of the things he taught. James Sunquist, a friend of mine from New Jersey area, up there someplace in your area. Uh, Glenn, uh, who are you? Uh, Diane? Uh, <laughs> who, uh, who did a great uh, expose of Hugh Ross's heresy. That's on our website if you want to read that. I wrote a small booklet by uh, uh, Stephen Lowell and Ken, uh, Ken Hoven and myself wrote this. By the way, one of the class requirements for this class to get credit is that you write a report on any one of the books on that list. Did you give those lists out? Yeah. Okay. Pick any book, write, read it, give this, when I taught CSE 101, this same material seven years ago, the same thing, one of the class requirements was read a book and write a, write a synopsis. The purpose of doing this is, number one, for you to read it and learn the material. Number two is if you write a nice little two or three or four page summary of this book, that is something we can put on our website. People say, I don't want to read the whole book. What's it about? Click, read a couple pages. Oh, okay, now I want to read it. Or if you do like Steve Lawwell did, he wrote about a 15-page synopsis of the gap theory, sent it in to get college credit. And I said, I called him right away. I said, Steve, this is incredible. I think you left out a couple things. Can, can I modify your term paper or your paper here? And let's publish it as a booklet because it really is well done. So I added all my stuff to Steve's stuff, and he and I are the co-authors. He was one of the college students taking a class like you're doing here. And so if you write, pick any one of those books and write something really good, we may say, hey, look, let's, uh, let's publish it as a booklet, sell it, you know. I said, Steve, the options are I either buy it off you outright, here's, you know, 500 bucks and I'll buy property rights to it, or we'll publish it and I'll split the profits with you. Whatever you want to do. I think it's good information. It needs to get out there. He said, Brother Hovind, I love your ministry. You just take it and publish it and you do what you want with it. So we've been, you know, it's a little $2 book we have. It's called The Gap Theory if you want more on that. Here's the history, and I like using timelines because I'm a visual person, you know, you've got to draw me a picture. Women think differently than men. You know, you give them directions. Oh, yeah, you go down to the blue building and turn left. I, draw me a map, okay? Show me. <laughs> Once I've seen it on paper, I got it. I can get it. Draw me a timeline. Explain it to me. James Hutton's book came out called The Theory of the Earth in 1795. People began to doubt the earth was 6,000 years old. This is where the problem started, at least in the Western world. Now, there have always been Buddhists and other oddball religions that teach the earth is millions of years old, okay? But as far as the Western world goes, this is where it started, late 1700s. Thomas Chalmers, thinking he was helping Christianity out, wrote about the gap theory. See, it started by people accepting the earth is billions of years old. Now, let's make the Bible say that. Darwin's book came out in 1859. And what happened when Darwin's book came out, there was no organized Christian resistance to that because they'd already been neutralized. Anybody in war, John, when you were in the Marines, they probably taught you, hey, when you're going to go in to attack, first you try to soften them up, confuse them, go in and change the road signs, you know, and 
lob a few bombs in behind the lines and try to disrupt their supply and you know you try to try to get them where they're not able to put up a good defense Normandy beaches they're going to storm the Normandy they did you know weeks and weeks of bombing and all kinds of stuff to soften up the defenses let's try to knock a few of these pillboxes out etc before we have to go in there with our rifles well Satan did a very effective job of softening up the Christians neutralizing their resistance with the gap theory and the day age theory so when Darwin's book came out, nobody hardly said a word. If the Christians would have been organized and stuck by their Bible, the Bible dates add up to 6,000 years, well, 4,000 BC. But it was so slick the way Satan did that, and it worked amazingly well. And there are still Christians 200 years later teaching that gap theory made up by Thomas Chalmers. If it was really part of Scripture, don't you think any Christian, nobody would have caught that for nearly 6,000 years till Thomas comes along? <laughs> Is this kind of new, some kind of new revelation or something? <laughs> Today, 75, actually 75 to 80 percent of children raised in Christian homes who attend public schools will reject the Christian faith by their first year of college. I think a lot of the blame can be laid at the feet of guys like Thomas Chalmers who, and Pember and Schofield for teaching a heresy. James chapter 3 says, Be not many masters, you know, not too many of you better be teachers. Why not? Because we shall receive the greater condemnation. If you're going to teach God's Word, you better take it real serious. I am scared to death. When I face God, I have spoken to about a thousand people a week for the last 10, 12 years since our ministry really grew. Do you realize how serious that is if I'm teaching something wrong? That's a scary thought. To whom much is given of him shall much be required. If God has given you a lot, healthy body, healthy brain, he's going to require a lot out of you. Some people, God gives them great big, huge physical bodies, lots of muscles every place, and they use it for their own glory. Boy, are they in trouble when they face God. Some people, God gives them a super high IQ up in the stratosphere, you know, and they use it for their own gain. Some people have the ability to make enormous amounts of money. And so what do they do? They spend it on themselves. Well, we've got to take a break here, but if God's given you a lot, and He has given all of us a lot, that's a scary thought. People say, Brother Hovind, what's your IQ? You're smart, aren't you? I said, oh, my school's told me it was real high, but that's, a, that's more scary than it is, you know, comforting. I'm going to be judged. My principal called me in eighth grade. He said, Hoven, he had, my two older brothers were Hovens too, so he didn't know which one I was. You're a Hoven, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a Hoven. <laughs> There's a bunch of you guys around here. He laid my IQ test down, eighth grade IQ. He said, this is the highest score we've ever had in this school. I said, thank you, sir. Then he laid, he laid my report card down. He said, explain this. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir, I can't explain. <laughs> I'm a goof off, I'm a bum, I'm lazy, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Too much is given, of him shall much be required. If God's given you a lot, you better take that, that better scare you to death. Are you doing your best? You know. Okay, after the break, we'll finish up about the day-age theory. Okay, let's take up where we left off. I went during the break and got a bunch of my different Bible versions from my collection. There are 151, I've heard, different English versions of the Bible. I want you to look at a couple of them here. Uh, Genesis 1-5 in the King James says it was the first day. Okay. What do you have in yours there, uh, John? Which one do you have? The New American Standard. New American Standard, which is a com NASB, very commonly used Bible, says... One day. Any difference between that and the first day? Okay. What do you have in yours there, Daniel? I got the New World Translation. New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness Bible. Okay. And God began calling the light day. And God, I got to repeat it so they can get it on tape here. And God began calling the light day. But the darkness he called. Night. But the darkness he called night. And there came to be evening. And there came to be evening. There came to be morning. There came to be morning. A first day. What happened to the first day? 
So they're going to argue, a, it was a first day when he started calling it day and night, you know. So there happened before that, but he just didn't call them that. That's their, that's their way to put millions of years into the story. Kevin, what do you have there? Which version? I have the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. God called the light day and the darkness night. Together these made up one day. Together these made up one day. Well, duh. Does that say it was the first day? No. no. Are there any footnotes in any of those that say the days might be periods of time? See if anybody has any footnotes in there on that one. Okay. Uh, Nathan, what do you have in yours? Which one you got? The Farrar Fenton Bible. We mentioned that earlier. I thought you ought to actually see it because, again, this is an example of putting on your own armor. It's not like what Brother Hovind said. Now you can say, I've seen it. Far Farrar Fenton really said that. And he did, didn't he? Sure did. <laughs> okay. You can read it for yourself. Okay, Robert, which one you got? We have the modern King James. Modern King James. And it says, And God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Were the first day. Very good. Now, footnotes. I want you to look at Genesis 1 1 and look at a very interesting difference. Brother, what do you have in there? What, which version? You, you got four of them side by side, right? Which one? No, which one you have? Revised, revised, revised substandard perversion. Yeah. That is the Bible I got for perfect attendance in the Methodist Church. Okay? That's, uh, that's the one right there. And that's the one I got saved out of. The reviled substandard perversion. But go ahead, read verse 5 there. There was evening, there was morning, one day. Who's got the four versions parallel? Uh, this one has four versions parallel, but there's a lot of pages on it. It says, pages taken for chapter on Genesis 1-1. It should be page 11, at least in the Bible. The pages are gone. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. But anyway, just to point out, most of them do teach that. Now, look at Genesis 1-1. How many of you have a version that says heaven singular? In the beginning, God created the heaven what does yours have? King James yes. says, the heaven. What does yours say? Uh, I have two now. The NIV says heavens. NIV says heavens, plural. And New Living Translation says heavens. New Living Translation says heavens. What do you have? Solar systems. What? Solar systems. Solar <laughs> systems, yeah. Solar systems, okay, <laughs> instead of heaven. Brother, what do yours have? Heavens, heavens plural. John? Heavens. heavens, plural? New World Translation is heavens, plural. King James is, if not the only one, it's one of the very few that says heaven. In the beginning, God created the heaven. Now, all through Scripture, well, I'll show you here. Let's just go to the back to the Bible search program. Now, let's type in the word heaven, singular, okay? There are 551 times where the Bible says heaven, singular, including Genesis 1.1, Genesis 1.8. God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. What does yours have in verse 8? Does it say, God called the firmament heaven, or does it say heavens? NASV has heaven. NASV has heaven, singular. Modern King James has heavens, plural. Modern King James has heavens, so he called the firmament heavens. Okay, what does yours have? Heaven. Heaven, singular. What do you have? Plural. Oh, you have plural. What version is yours? It's the Farrar Fenton. Oh, heavens, plural, okay. And you have? Heaven, singular, uh, reviled substandard. And? and then NIV and the New Living both say sky. NIV and New Living both say sky, okay. <laughs> How about uh, verse 9? And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. King James. Here says heavens. Yeah. Plural, heavens. Plural, heavens in verse 9. Heavens, heavens plural. Uh, sky. sky. Heavens. heavens, plural. Heavens. heavens, plural. Well, somebody's wrong. Is it heaven or heavens? Uh, verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. Verse 14 says what in the Fenton Bible? Let reflectors appear in the expanse. <laughs> reflectors? And it's pluralized heavens again. 
Is he implying the sun is a reflector or? Now the moon is a reflector, I would go along with that, but let reflectors appear, <laughs> okay? Uh, what do you have in yours there? Luminaries. Let the, luminaries, okay. Let the illuminaries. Let the illuminaries appear. Jehovah's Witness. Yep. It, it's plural. Plural? Heavens. It's almost easy to understand. This is lights in the expanse of the sky. Lights in the expanse of the sky in the Living Bible. No, the, in the NIV. NIV. Verse 14. Let the bright lights appear in the sky. You got to understand, in order to get a copyright, you're not, they're not going to grant you a copyright unless what you are producing is substantially different than what somebody else produced. And they have defined substantially different as at least 10% different. So if you want to get a copyright, you have to make at least 10% of the words different. Which means there are 151 versions of the Bible in English. Are there 151 possible ways to say Genesis 1-1? I mean, at some point, you're going to have a problem, I would think, okay? <laughs> you can't say what it really means without making some serious changes here, okay? So, Nathan's question was, is it heaven or heavens, all right? It is heaven singular in verse 1. Later here, God divides it up into heavens. I'm going to add the word S on here. Genesis 2, verse 1, is the first time the word heavens appears in the King James. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. So here in chapter 2, verse 1, God is telling us that during the first chapter, He made the heavens. But each time He made one, He called it the heaven singular. This is critically important, I think. First Genesis 1, 1, He made the heaven, which means the expanded place. It went from earth all the way to wherever. Then He describes slicing it up into three parts. The heaven where the birds fly, verse 21. The heaven where the stars are, verse, 20, or verse 14 and 16. And then F F Corinthians tells us about the heaven where God lives. Third heaven. Apparently, the third heaven, it's only mentioned one time in the Bible, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let God, Paul said, I was caught up to the third heaven. Apparently, that's where God lives. Because Paul, I think, actually died at Lystra. He was actually stoned to death, I believe. Uh, and he actually got to see heaven. And later he's writing about it, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, I knew a man 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Only mention of it anywhere in Scripture. But it seems like God made the earth all of the expanded place in verse 1. Then he spends the next six days making everything on that first one, slicing up the heaven, and dividing it by layers of water. So my cosmology, my view of the universe would be this. When God first made it, there's the earth, layer of air to breathe, layer of water to protect them, called the canopy. We'll get into them or the later, hoping to tonight, into the canopy theory if we get time. Then there's a huge layer of stars and planets, bazillions of miles thick. And then another layer of water. I believe Psalm 148 teaches there is still water above the heavens. Where's the last star? What's on the other side? Nobody knows. Is there a last star? It's not possible for the brain to comprehend that there is no end to space. I mean, we just automatically assume there must be an end. But the Bible says the Lord sits on many waters. Is the third heaven then above water? And it says in Psalm 148, Praise Him, ye waters that be above the heavens. Well, here's the psalmist writing, you know, 15, 2,000 years later, after the creation, saying, or 3,000 years later, 1,000 years uh, B.C., David lived. He's writing, the waters that be above the heavens. Uh, that's the only clues I have, and I sure wouldn't be dogmatic on a teaching like that, but it appears to me like the Bible teaches there was earth, layer of air, water, layer of stars, water. Take it for what it's worth. We'll get into more of that later. But heavens does not appear till Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. So he is describing here, obviously recapping all of chapter 1. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and the host of them. So 
This is the first mention of heavens, plural. There are 127 references to heavens, okay, in, uh, in the Bible. Uh, Bill Sardi, a friend of mine, uh, some of you met Bill Sardi, a nutrition genius in California who also is uh, just a real sharp thinker. He wrote a book in, uh, for our ministry to sell called Big God Versus Big Science. This is all about the heresies of Hugh Ross and some of the crazy things he teaches. There's another really good book called Refuting Compromise. If you want to get into just studying Hugh Ross, and he has a huge following, by the way. He's, been, he's on TBN every week. If you've never seen Hugh Ross, uh, tall, thin uh, astronomer from Toronto, Canada, real bald-headed, uh, real nice guy, smart guy, and he goes on teaching about how the, you know, the earth is really billions of years old, and God needed billions of years to get it just right. And I said, well, Hugh, wouldn't the flood destroy all the evidence of that? He said, oh, it was just a local flood. First he says it's a universal flood. And then you've got to say, what do you mean universal flood? He says, well, it flooded Noah's little universe, the valley that he lived in. I said, well, then why did God tell Noah to build that big boat and fill it full of animals and sit in there for a year? Why didn't he tell Noah to move? I mean, we don't know how long it took him to build the ark, okay? Uh, some people say, well, 120 years. The Bible doesn't say that. I defy you to show me that in the Bible. God says his day shall be 120 years. It doesn't mean Noah started building the ark then. Hebrew tradition says it took him five years to build the boat. That's purely Hebrew tradition. Where they get that, I have no clue. They have another Hebrew tradition that says Adam and Eve had 56 children. Where they get that, I don't know. Okay? I mean, that's possible. 800 years of having kids in a world where you got the whole place, no food, no limit, unlimited food supply, you <laughs> know. Why not have 56 kids, you know? But that's purely tradition also. Anyway, this book is about Hugh Ross's false teaching. Uh, her a heresy is something that... Te well, here's, I called Hugh Ross a heretic. I was nice about it. I said, what you're teaching is heresy. He did not like that, still does not like that, and won't debate me again, I guess, because of that. But here's the dictionary definition of heresy from the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Heresy, a fundamental error in religion or an error of opinion respecting some fundamental doctrine of religion. But in countries where there is an established church, an opinion is deemed heresy when it differs from that of the church. The scriptures being the standard of faith, any opinion that is repugnant to its doctrines is heresy. But as men differ in the interpretation of scripture, an opinion deemed heretical by one body of Christians may be deemed orthodox by another. In scripture and primitive usage, heresy meant merely a sect, a party, or the doctrines of a sect, as we now use the denomination or persuasion implying no reproach. Heresy in law is an offense against Christianity consisting in a denial of some of its essential doctrines. Number, third definition, an untenable, untenable or unsound opinion. So heretic is a person of, under any religion, that, but particularly the Christian, who holds and teaches opinions repugnant to the established faith. So when Hugh Ross says, the earth is billions of years old, that's not necessarily a heresy. I believe it is repugnant to the scripture, so I would call it a heresy, but some people don't. When he teaches it's a local flood in the days of Noah, now that to me is a heresy. When he teaches there was death before Adam sinned, that in my mind is no question, a heresy. So if somebody's teaching heresy is a heretic. <laughs> That's not that's meant to be a slam, it's just meant that's the truth, okay? Expose the truth. Genesis 1, 6. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. What does some of the other Bibles say on that one, some of the other versions? Genesis 1, 6. Some of the other perversions. Who's got one of those there? Genesis 1, 6 in the uh, modern King James. There you go. Let there be an expanse in the middle of the waters. I think you'll find almost all Bible scholars and Hebrew scholars will tell you this word firmament means an expanded place, an open place. So God created the heaven and the expanse. It was just one singular expanse. Then he divides it up in three slices. What's yours say, John? New, New American Standard? Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Kevin, what does uh, NIV have? Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate the water from the water. Jehovah's Witness Bible? God went to say, let there be an expanse from the, Wait a minute. God went to say? 
God, God, went on to say, God went on to say, let an expanse come be in between the waters and divide. Let an expanse come in between the waters and divide the waters. And occur between the waters and the waters. The waters and the waters. Okay, good. Okay. Basically, they all say roughly the same thing. I mean, something similar. Okay. Some people say, well, if the firmament keeps the water away from the water, then it must be the dirt. And there are people who argue that the firmament means the earth itself. Because it's true, the dirt keeps the water separated into different piles, you know, uh, into different puddles. But it can't be the dirt in, verse, in the front of Genesis 1. Look at verse 20. God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl, that's birds, that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. This is an example of 1 Peter chapter 2 where it says, No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Don't take one verse and say, Wow, I know what that means, until you've read all the verses about that topic. Because you can take a phrase here and a phrase there and make the Bible say a lot of things it really doesn't say, if you're not careful. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. You heard about the guy who was going to commit suicide. Anybody heard that story? He says, I'm going to commit suicide, but before I do, I'm going to read what the Bible says. So he gets his Bible and he flops it open and it says, Judas went out and hanged himself. He says, oh, I don't want that verse. Let me try again. He opens up again, flops it open, puts his finger down and says, Go ye therefore and do likewise. <laughs> I don't want that one. So he closes it, tries another one, opens it up and says, What thou doest, do quickly. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, you can make it say about anything if you're going to do it like that, all right? So you've got to take Scripture with Scripture. Here we have an example uh, where you have to put all the scriptures together. Genesis 1, 6 says there is a firmament and waters, a firmament in the midst of the waters. Now, if you're just going to look at that verse and try to figure out what this means, you're going to have a hard time. So you look at verse 20. It gives us more clues about the firmament. The birds fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now, here we have... 10 verses, 15 verses later, the Bible pretty clearly explaining what the firmament is. What is the firmament, quite obviously? The air, the place where the birds fly. The birds don't fly in the dirt. The birds fly in the air, okay? So the Bible usually explains itself. If you come across a phrase or a verse or a word, you, I don't understand that, just keep reading. Keep going. All of a sudden it'll jump out at you. Oh, now I get it. You ever read that? I taught math and I loved it. When you see the light come on kids' face, you know, you're trying to explain a concept in mathematics. You probably all had that. How many have had that happen to you? I don't get it. I don't get it. All of a sudden, oh, now I get it. <laughs> Duh, right? That's what's going to happen three seconds after we get to heaven. I don't understand a lot of things about the Trinity. I don't understand that. I don't understand about eternity, you know, no time. I mean, come on. We're going to get there and say, oh, now I get it. <laughs> right now, either the brain won't hold it, or we can't understand it, or something's wrong. But we don't. I'm not getting it. I know that. Um, Genesis 1:14, and God said, "Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night." That would be obviously the sun, moon, and stars. And He made the stars also. So here we have verse 14 and 16 telling us pretty clearly that the lights are in the firmament which is outer space. Now, is this firmament the same as the one in verse 21 where the birds fly? Uh, I don't think so, but to an observer on the ground, I mean, looking up from here, I can't tell where, where atmosphere ends and space begins. You know, you go up 10 miles and the air gets real thin. You go up 100 miles and it's just gone. But I can see the sun 93 million miles away. Where's the line where it stops? Well, today there, there's not really a distinct line because air molecules are kind of, you know, bouncing around up there, getting thinner and thinner. But basically, there's a border someplace up there where there's not enough air to worry about. And the space shuttle tries to fly just, you know, above that, so there's no friction. If they're in the air, they got all this resistance and they got to keep burning fuel and keep it going. They don't want that, so they get up outside the air and just kind of float around. You get going fast enough, there's nothing to slow you down. For, I mean, eventually it'll slow down, but uh, they don't, you know, they can drift around for a long time. Who cares? Well, um, I think this firmament is talking about a totally new firmament from the one where the birds fly. This is outer space. And then you have 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
Paul saying, I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. He was caught up to the third heaven. As I mentioned, this is the only reference to the third heaven in the Bible that I can find. Now the Mormons teach there are three heavens, terrestrial, uh, the earth heaven, where they live for a while, and then the celestial, and then, the, what's the third one? Uh, we've got three. Anyway, they teach that if you're a really good Mormon here on earth, when you die, you get to move up a notch. You know, you kind of get reincarnated, move up a notch. And they teach, of course, that they started off this life actually in heaven as a spirit baby, and they came down to earth and were given a body, and they live here, and if they're a good Mormon and obey all the laws and go to church and, of course, give their money, then they get to go to a, you know, a higher heaven, and they get to eventually become God. Bottom line is you get to be God. Now, in your pre-existence on earth, they teach you existed in heaven as a spirit baby. And if you were a good spirit baby in heaven, God gave you a white body when you came to earth. If you were a bad spirit baby, you got a black body when you came to earth. And so they look at black people and say, well, he must have been a bad spirit baby. Honestly, that's, what, that's their teaching. Okay, we'll get into more of that later. Uh, in Psalm 19, it says, The heavens, plural, declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Well, 2 Corinthians says the third heaven. We know there are at least three, and maybe only three. Again, I wouldn't be dogmatic. That's, the Bible doesn't say much about this. This is all the verses I can find. But it says, heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Genesis 1, 7. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Now it's pretty clear the firmament is where the birds fly and there's a firmament where the stars are. So here, God divided the waters when he first made it, it was earth covered in water. Then in verse 9, he made the dry land appear. So in verse 7, the dry land has not appeared yet. He divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. I take that to mean he put water above the atmosphere. Now there are some people, some good Christian organizations that do not believe this. Walt Brown was a guest on my radio program last week. We sell his book, In the Beginning, a great book, okay? He's a brilliant physicist, taught at the Air Force Academy for years, good friend of mine, on my program for an hour just last week. He does not believe in what's called the canopy theory. He does not believe there was ever water above the atmosphere because he says you have a problem with the greenhouse effect, you build up too much heat, blah, blah, blah. I've read all their arguments, answers in Genesis. He does not believe there was a canopy above the atmosphere. Carl Baugh, good friend of mine from Longview, or from, uh, from uh, Texas, spoke at our boot camp last year. He says, oh yeah, there had to be a canopy above there. And his book that we sell in our bookstore there, called The Panorama of Creation, deals exactly with that. Is this one of the books on the re recommended reading list? No, uh, not Let's add that, okay? Panorama of Creation by Carl Baugh. Number one, it's a small book. You can read it pretty quick. It was on the original. Okay, put it back on there. That should be, that's a good one. If you want to learn about the canopy, he's, if you want to really get into the study, this book uh, by Joseph Dillo called The Waters Above is extremely thorough on what's called the canopy theory. He says, yep, there was water above the atmosphere. Now, the guy who wrote the foreword to this book is Henry Morris at Institute for Creation Research. They have taught for years there was a canopy of water above the atmosphere, and now because of some pressure from AIG, I suspect, they are backing off saying, no, maybe there was not a canopy of water above. So was there or was there not a layer of water above the atmosphere? There are really good Christians who differ on this topic, okay? Just make you aware of that. I firmly believe there had to be a canopy of water for numerous reasons. Scriptural reasons, number one. Scientific reasons, uh, number two. And a lot of those scientific reasons, we'll get into that in a little bit. Here we have Psalm 148. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters, notice that, that be above the heavens. Here's King David writing, uh, I think he wrote Psalm 148, he wrote a lot of the Psalms, but somebody about King David's time is saying, waters that, there's still water above the heavens. 
Now I think, like as I mentioned earlier, this is referring to, you know, the canopy of uh, the water beyond the stars. Second Peter 3 said, The scoffers are willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens, plural, how, by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What does that mean? How can the earth possibly be out of the water and in the water? I don't think that's possible unless you have a canopy of water above the atmosphere. In that case, you would have some of the earth standing up out of the water, i.e. continents, mountain ranges, and you have all of that in the water, the canopy above. The Bible says the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. By the way, Christians have always known the earth is round. And he stretcheth out the heavens, plural, as a curtain to dwell in. By the way, 17 times in the Bible, it says God stretched out the heavens. We'll get into more of this later, but if somebody ever asks you, well, how did the light from the stars get here? Anybody heard that question? If the earth's only 6,000 years old, how did the light from the stars get here? I say, well, you're asking the wrong question. The question is not how did the light get from there to here. The question is how did the star get from here to there? Suppose God made the earth first, which he did. Then he made the stars, you know, 14 verses later. Genesis 1, 14 made the stars also. And then he stretched out the stars from here. Adam would see the light first day. He, he's awake, first night anyway. And he'd see it the second night and the third night. All this while, the star is being stretched out into its place. Seventeen times it says he stretched out the heavens, so apparently this is some kind of important doctrine God wants to get across or he wouldn't waste seventeen verses on it and all them trees they got to cut down to print all them pages. So, heavens, plural. Stretched out, we'll get into more of that in video seven. Today's atmosphere that we're breathing has six layers. We have the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, and ionosphere. They are very, very distinct layers. Last year I was flying back from Germany and I'm on this huge airplane flying across the ocean, you know, and it was, I forget, April, I think, you know, you know, on the ground below me. It was nice. It was, you know, 70 degrees. We're up in the airplane. They got the little sign come up. Anybody ever flown on these long flights where they got the numbers come up on the screen and it tells you how fast you're going, you know, wind speed and all this stuff. They got this little screen comes up and it says we are at 39,000 feet. So I got my little calculator, 39,000. That's seven miles. Seven miles up. And it says outside temperature minus 85 negative 85 degrees at seven miles up. If you look at this earth science textbook here, it shows the, the red line indicates the temperature. If it is at the ground level, according to this chart, uh, 10 degrees centigrade, which would be, uh, what's that, 50, 10 degrees centigrade, say, about, I'm just guessing, about 50 degrees, you know, a little chilly, nice day. You go up, uh, they're saying here, you go up 15, 12 miles, and it's minus 55 centigrade, roughly nearly 80 degrees below zero. As you go up higher, it stays real, real. Notice there's a band, though. I'll get over here where you can point to this since they're going to be editing it anyway. Right in here, it's, you know, minus 80 degrees. As you get up higher altitude, it starts to warm up. You have another cold spot and then it starts to cool off again. By the time you get way up there, the altitude here is uh, 90 kilometers, which is about 65 miles up. It's extremely cold again. There are two very, very extremely cold, cold bands in our atmosphere. Now, the airplanes never get, you know, standard commercial airplanes anyway, never get above, you know, seven or eight miles. So they're not going to go through all that. But it gets pretty cold. And they fly up there real high for two reasons. Number one, it, the air is thinner, so they have less resistance. And the air is colder, so it's more compacted. So when the plane is sucking in the air, every cubic foot of air has more oxygen molecules, except that it's thinner. But because it's colder, it kind of compensates for that. But you know, that's why you feel so excited when you get out and run around and it's cold outside. <sighs> Man, it's like you got a turbocharger on, you know? Because when it's hot, all your energy is zapped out of you, okay? Well, I believe somewhere 10 or 15 miles above the Earth's surface, there was a canopy of ice or water. All of the air that we now have that stretches out 100 miles was pressed into this 
pick a number and say 15 mile layer of air, I mean, Adam wouldn't notice if it's, if it's over 50 feet, that's all you need to breathe, okay? If it's five, you know, 15 miles, that's plenty. You're not going to go up and touch the ceiling. But this canopy theory, which I believe and many Christians believe, and many Christians do not believe, okay? I think it's, it's absolutely correct, and I'm willing to defend it in a debate against anybody. But there was a crystalline canopy around the earth. Around the earth. I happen to believe, like Carl Baugh, and I have some good reasons for this, that the canopy was actually in the form of ice, which is still water, just frozen. And it was probably 10 or 30 inches thick, I know, 10, 20, 30 inches thick. One of the arguments against the canopy theory that the evolution, or that the creationists use even, uh, they'll say, well, if you put 40 feet of water up there, it's going to block out the sunlight. That's correct. And they'll say, see, the canopy can't be true. You're building a straw man, okay? Well, if you drive your car 400 miles an hour, the hood's going to fly off. Yeah, that's probably correct, okay? But you're probably not going to drive your car 400 miles an hour, right? And it's true, you're not going to put 40 feet of water. And they'll say, well, you have to have 40 feet of water up there to make enough rain to go 40 days and 40 nights and flood the world. You don't, they're assuming all kinds of things that are not correct in that one. They're assuming all the flood water came from rain. It did not. Where did most of the water for the flood come from? in the crust of the earth. Read the Bible, okay? The fountains of the deep broke open. Plus, they're assuming you got to have 40 days worth of rain stored up in the sky. Well, if the fountains of the deep are broken up, you got water shooting up out of the ground that's going to eventually come back down. You could have the rain coming from inside the ground in that situation. Ice at extremely low temperatures is magnetic. According to Dr. Baugh and others who've studied this, I've not seen it that cold, but say 400 below zero Fahrenheit, ice becomes magnetic, and you can pick it up with a magnet. So <clears throat> if the Earth's magnetic field suspended this layer of ice, no more problem. One of their arguments is, if you get 10 or 20 or 30 inches of ice or 40 feet of water, what's going to hold it up? That's honestly a fair question, okay, I understand. But <clears throat> if it's an, a canopy of ice around the Earth, you got several options, and maybe it's a combination of all of these. One, it could be the Earth's magnetic field. Two, it could be the air pressure. If it was continuous with no leaks in it, air pressure would hold it up. Three, if it is spinning, centrifugal force could hold it out. A hula hoop effect, okay? Uh, the Japanese use a maglev trains. Have you ever seen or heard of those things? You know, they levitate the train off the tracks with magnets. They go 300 miles an hour because they're not really rolling on the tracks. I mean, they bump into it from time to time, but basically it's magnetic, so it's, it's held up off the tracks with magnetic levitation. The picture in the upper left-hand corner is a block of ice floating above a magnet because it is super cold, like 400 below zero. We have the experiment we do upstairs, the, the Meisner effect, you know, that little thing that spins and it hovers above the magnet. Uh, sure, that's not a problem. Kevin, we got 10 minutes. Can you write up? You can't walk. Nathan, you know what I'm talking about, right? By the magnet display, that little round silver and black thing that spins. It's in the window ledge. Yeah, right by the, right, grab that bring that in here if you would. Here's an article from Astronomy Magazine, astronomy.com. They said ice clouds are forming from the shuttle's exhaust. Space shuttle takes off, leaves behind a lot of exhaust. I mean, they burn like, I don't know, 16,000 pounds a second or something like that. It's phenomenal the amount of fuel they burn to get that thing off the ground. <laughs> well, all this exhaust, some of it turns to water. You know, you can watch anybody's muffler going down the highway, the water drips out, okay, of the muffler, uh, of the tailpipe. Well, this water up there in space is freezing, super cold, minus 220, and it's slowly drifting over these ice clouds and they're hovering above the North and South Pole. They're stuck in space floating 51 miles above the Arctic Circle. Well, 51 miles is where that second heat sink is, where it gets really, really cold. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. Here we have, in the base of this little contraption, some magnets. In this thing, there are some more magnets, but you have north against north. And opposites repel, except in San Francisco. Okay, But <laughs> if you get this thing spinning here, it'll actually hover above the other magnets. Well, if man can make a little toy that'll do this, couldn't God have made a world that would do this? Would be a simple logical argument I would use. You know, you got the little magnet spinning on top of the other magnet, and oh, 
long as it gets in just the right spot, it'll just, you know, stay right there. I don't know if you can zoom in on the airspace between it there, Keith. Stays right there. That's called the Meisner effect. That'd be a good quiz question. Meisner, uh, M-Y-S-N-E-R, is the guy who did a lot of study on this about magnets floating on another magnet. And they actually produce pressure, which has to make everybody wonder, what is a magnetic wave? Is it, you know, what is magnetism? I, know, I don't know anybody that knows, and I taught physical science. I wish I knew, you know, is it a wave? Is it a particle? You know, it goes through anything. Uh, it does not go through some, it goes through many things, does not go through some things, you know. I don't know what it is, but anyway. Um, here's the book of Josephus, who was a historian writing about the time of Christ, you know, think about a hundred years after, if I recall. But Josephus said that, he's talking about what the Bible teaches. He said, after this, on the second day, he placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts and determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament round it. Dr. Dr. Baugh, in his book, says that if you get ice colder and colder and colder and colder, you know, when water, as it gets cold, it gets down to four degrees above freezing, and instead of continuing to shrink like most fluids do, all of a sudden it expands. Extremely unusual, and it's a good thing it does, because as the water expands in order to freeze, it now floats on top of the water. Ice floats on water. What would happen if it didn't? It'd kill all the fish in the world first winter. Because the ice would form, drop to the bottom. Next layer forms, drops to the bottom. Pretty soon the whole pond is frozen solid. But as it is, ice freezes, makes a layer on top. Underneath, the water's 32 degrees. It's never, it can't be any, if it's less than 32, it's going to freeze. Unless it's moving real fast, you might get it a little colder. You know, movement might keep it going. But So, it says he placed a crystal in front of it. Now, Dr. Baugh says, and I think he's right, that at super low temperatures, ice takes on totally different qualities. If you take a piece of ice and hit it with a hammer, it's going to shatter, pop, you know, crack all over the place. But if you get it colder and colder and colder, it takes on a property, it becomes malleable. M-A-L, malleable, I-B-L-E. Lead, for instance, is malleable. Clay is malleable. Take a lump of clay, smack it with a hammer, does it shatter? No. Kind of flattens out, right? Gold is malleable. Gold is one of the most malleable substances there is. You can take gold and beat it with a hammer and beat it into such a thin sheet that it's only two or three atoms thick. Real thin. You could probably take an ounce of gold and beat it into a sheet thin enough to just about cover America. It goes real thin. It's malleable. Well, you can't do that with ice. It's going to just bust up into pieces, okay? But super cold ice becomes malleable. And according to Dr. Ball, and I think uh, it sure preaches good. And I wouldn't say this is uh, scripture, but it's just a good theory. An excellent book, by the way. He says there was a canopy of water, or ice technically, above the Earth's atmosphere. And there was water under the crust of the Earth. And I believe I can prove that in a second here, but we're going to run out. We'll take that up next week. Um, this ice, he says, was not only malleable, he says at super low temperatures, you have, if you've ever seen ice, when it freezes, it turns into a six-sided crystal, like a snowflake, and it traps a little air, bu air bubble in the center. Well, the hydrogen and oxygen in a, in a water molecule is always at a, like a Mickey Mouse with a big face and the two ears, okay? You've got the two hydrogens and the oxygen, and it's about a 105 degree angle between the two ears, okay? 105, a little more than 90 degrees. Well, when it freezes, it turns to ice and gets this six-sided crystal configuration. If you keep getting it colder and colder and colder, it takes on a totally new crystalline structure, and you get a layer of hydrogen and a layer of oxygen, a layer of hydrogen and a layer of oxygen. It's like it's laminated steel. You ever seen where they get little thin sheets of steel, put them all together and make like a, a transformer or something, you know? Water becomes, takes on those characteristics. When it becomes like that, he covers this in the book, it not only is malleable, it won't shatter when you hit it, it flattens out. It behaves like gold or lead. It's malleable. It becomes fiber optic. You shine a light on one side and it transmits the light to the other side. Which means if the sun is shining on one side of the world, the other side has a night light. That's why I said earlier, I'm not sure that when it says the lesser light means the moon. 
might mean the moon, it might not mean the moon. It just says the lesser light. It doesn't say. I don't know if the word moon, yeah, I guess the word moon is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, moon. Let me uh, check it out here. Um, Psalm 143, Trinity and Son of the Moon. Trinity. Yeah, 51 references to moon. Yeah. Moons. 11 references to moons, the new moons, okay, referring to more a month instead of an actual planet, you know, or body, or earthly, heavenly body. So, um, what on earth? There. Water above the atmosphere, water uh, under the crust of the earth. We'll take that up next week when we, or no, next January when we start up CSE 202. Uh, this water ab underneath the crust of the earth. All right, uh, any questions or comments so far? I hate to leave hanging in the middle of an interesting thought here, but we've got to go. The uh, Bible says the scoffers would be willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth. I think we as Christians need to understand what that creation was like. All of a sudden, other things start to make sense. Let's be dismissed. Thank you so much. For more information and other materials offered by Creation Science Evangelism, call us at 850-479-DINO. That's 850 850- 479-3466 or visit us online at www.drdino.com That's www.drdino.com